Thank you. I'm Dan Hanessian and the director of the Broadway Technical Theater History Project, and it's with great ple pleasure I, I welcome all of you here tonight uh, for the second annual Backstage Legends and Masters Award. This has been a tremendously wonderful experience for me, and I think by the end of the night you'll see why. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to meet Arnold and to get to know more about his history. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Arnold Abramson. Thank you. Have a seat. <laughs> so, one of the reasons the Broadway Technical Theater History Project was started was to start documenting the backgrounds and histories of the people who've been uh, so important to the production of shows over the years, and that maybe people don't know as many things about as they might. So, in the process of selecting you and then doing my research on you, I went to a variety of sources to find out as much as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, one of the great resources that's out there is uh, IBDB, the Internet, Broadway Internet Database. So I went in, I plugged in your name, and what I got back was your search for Arnold Abramson did not find any results. <laughs> uh, if you're not sure of the spelling, try searching for just the first few characters, the first or last name of the show title, et cetera. Uh, so you're apparently not represented anywhere, so I don't know what you've done. but. Um. <laughs> So then, of course, the internet being the internet, uh, I plugged in your name again in Google, and uh, up came IMDB, the film and TV, and, and actually you've done one thing in 1993. Uh, you were a scenic artist on the Nutcracker yeah. that was filmed. Interestingly enough, here at Purchase, so. Yeah, that's where it was filmed. So, which was interesting. So it was uh, a little challenging to find some information on you, but we put it together, and we, we'll talk about that some. So let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Newark, New Jersey. So Newark, New Jersey. And then did you grow up in New Newark, or did you stay put, or where did you? No, my father moved around a lot. We ended up living in Flushing. OK. And then did you go to grade school in the end? Uh... Went to grade school in Flushing, and then to the High School of Music and Art, which is LaGuardia which is now High School the... now. They and... moved into the city, too. And what were you like in grade school? What were you, did you have hobbies? Did you play sports? What did you do? No, I loved to draw. And I, I don't know how they let me out of there because I was a lousy student. I wasn't <laughs> interested in it. it and did you, did you do any theater when you were growing up at all? No. So you didn't? So you, just, you were pretty much, I guess, a painter, artist? Paint, that sort trying of to be an artist, yes. And then when you were early learning how to paint or doing things. When, do you remember when you first picked up a brush and started painting and thinking, this is something I really enjoy doing? Mm. Well, my mother found a teacher down there, and I was, I think, 12 years old. And she talked about her studies at the Art Students League. That, and then I went to study with him. It was Moses Sawyer, mm. the brother of Rayfield Sawyer. Right. And that was it. And draw, draw, draw. Yeah. And then you go to High School of the Arts. Yeah, music and art, yeah. What was that experience like? Because that was, I, I guess, you had to go from where you were living in Flushing. It was an hour's uh, train ride. So it was a hike. Yeah. So that's a, a commitment to go to that high school. And then what was the experience like? What, were the, what was the atmosphere like? What was your class load, that sort of thing? Well, again, uh, it was the same thing, draw, paint. There were a few wonderful teachers there, and uh, also classmates, and we're still friends, and, and they're wonderful painters. And were you required at lunchtime to sing and dance on the tables, or is that just a... <laughs> no, okay. no. All right. Just check. It's my view of it. All right, so after high school, uh, in, you're, you're focused as a studio artist, and you're interested in following paint, so you move to Philly, or you go to school in Philly. Went to Tyler. At, at Tyler. Temple University. Okay. And what was that? Did you spend four years at Tyler doing studio art? Actually, three and a half years. I found out if I spent the summer there and did some frescoes, I could graduate. I did it. So it was actually three and a half years. 
And were you were you following a school of art at that time? Were you following? Were there particular artists, painters that you whose work you admired and wanted to to be similar to, or were you going your own path? Well, uh, the Sawyer's had a great influence on us, and he also taught some of my friends. I introduced them, and he taught them, and that was my big influence. And is there a particular medium you were working in at that time that you you favored one way or the other? Well, we did everything, oil, pastel, water, everything. And what was your goal? While you were a student in college as a studio fine artist, what, what was your goal? What was your expectation? What were you going to do after you graduated? Did you have a, a career lined up? No. I was going to do what I wanted to do, just that, paint. Right. Nothing lined up. No. So that didn't work out. What happened? What, because there was a change of plan at some point. So, Well... Uh, hmm. I heard about the union. We won't go into this whole bit about that, but I heard about the union, and television had really blossomed at that time. So, and they didn't have enough scenic artists, so there are openings there. And did you have a friend who was here in New York that you were talking to about all of this and, and encouraged you to come up, or did you just happen to come back to New York and tumble well, into this? Well, I came back to New York and lived in Queens and I uh, tumbled into it. Okay. They were painting scenery at CBS and I thought, that's strange, how did this happen? And I found their, their uncle was a, an assistant charge man at CBS, so that made it easy for them to paint at CBS. And do you remember the first show you painted when you came up as a scenic artist? Well, they, First of all, let me say what the union was like at that time. It was on in the East 50s, no, the West 50s, and it was one room, the financial secretary and the business agent. And those who are familiar with the union now can see the transition, what happened. It's, it's more than just two people now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. In different locations all over the city. Anyway, uh, what happened for new people uh, they had what they called the steward system. They're still stewards, but at that right. time it was a different steward each week in each shop. So five o'clock on Friday afternoon, you'd go up there, and as you arrived, they gave you a slip. That's how you were called. And then you... <laughs> they gave you... Uh, if you were number one, you were the first one they called. Mm. And you got a sl they were given a slip with the name of a studio that was working that week. And, and was it seniority based or was it no. you, just, you randomly p you pulled you numbers were, out of a hat? You came and you in. Okay. And anyway, uh, living in Queens, I didn't want to pull a studio that was in New Jersey, but you could trade off. Once you got everybody got their ticket, I'd trade off for Manhattan. I didn't right. want to go to Jersey. <laughs> and that's how. Uh, that was the whole thing, and the, the, you were the shop steward that week. Right. Unless they kept you on beyond that. Then another shop steward would come. But they never told you what a shop steward did. I, I mean, it, it, it must, was must have been easy to do the job that way. Well, anyway, so that's what happened. Now, you went straight from studio painting. And what, what scale of painting as a studio artist were you doing? What was, what was the size of the canvas or painting that you were typically doing at that time? Oh, let's say a big painting would be four, four foot by four foot. So you went from that scale to scene painting where the scale is significantly bigger. bigger. What was the transition like for you as an artist to go from one to the other? Very easy. I had no trouble with that. So it was just... <laughs> <laughs> no, well... So, uh, so uh, were you painting with really long-handled brushes to begin with, or was that... You mean at the studio? Yeah, when you were when you're doing your fine painting, were you standing oh. back with a long brush and oh no no uh, short brush short brush? Okay. No, they uh, it was it was just very simple that way. You were thrown into a place. Well, basically at the beginning you were only painting props, right? Because they didn't know you, they didn't know what you could do. But then, you know, they become familiar with what you can do with what you can do, and you progress. Now your first period of time in New York painting, you were, I guess, officially a non-union painter. Is that true? Or did you join the union right away? They took you in because 
there were, they, they needed people. There weren't enough artists to cover what they needed, or designers. So you went quickly from being a studio artist to being a union painter, is that? Yeah. So your entrance into 829 consisted of what? Just saying, I'm happy to be a union painter? Or did you have to take a test, or? Well, they were giving tests, but that was only once a year. Right. And they needed people. So they gave you a card? Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of people who are very jealous right now. I, I was very lucky. When you, so now when you started. Well, you had, a, you had to show your work. They right. They didn't just accept you as there, but I really don't remember much of that. Right. You don't, I mean, you, would, you weren't involved in doing the, the exam or taking no. the test and all that? No. Okay. So when you first started, did you have a mentor? Did you have somebody in the industry who was kind of showing you the ropes, or did you just find your own way? You were thrown in. You were the shop steward, right? They really had to have a shop steward. Right. So I think basically, if you could do anything, they were, they felt lucky mm. because they didn't know what they were going to get. And in the first couple of years, what were the types of things you were painting? <laughs> Props. Props. <laughs> no, uh, you, you didn't get to work on drops. You just the menial stuff. For for Broadway shows, for yeah, Broadway shows. Because there was also a lot of TV at that time and other stuff too. TV. Yeah, I mean, well. The TV studios were really short of people. Right. The shops really weren't. I mean, they, they were to a point, but not, not as much as the TV studios. And at that time, what were, the, what, were the, what were the shops that you were working at? What were the shops that were in the industry? Well, I traded off. Well, at that time, um, a lot of them were just t doing TV. Right. And uh, they faded away. Uh, but I worked mostly at Dunkel Studios and Triangle Studios. And where, where was Dunkel's located? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. On the west side. They had a shop with paint frames. And then who, whose shop was that? That was? Eugene Dunkel. Eugene, okay. And he had a, uh, a son who ran the shop, really, who wasn't really a good artist. Right. But we were there. And what was, what was that shop like? What were the kinds of things you were painting? What was the atmosphere like? Well, one thing, we were doing TV up at uh, Mesmore and Damon, which was uptown in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. it was a, uh, that was a studio that did automated figures for the World's Fair, and that was their thing. But they built television scenery for Dunkel. Okay. We'd work up there when there was stuff for that, and then we, we're back at the main shop. And the one big job we did was La Forza del Destino for the Met Opera. Mm. And they rented space on Broadway. There was a shafts on Broadway in the 70s. And the second floor was a big, big floor. And we, three or four of us worked there and did that opera. Now, you also worked at Triangle, which yes. was the legacy, I guess, of Joseph Urban yes. and his crew that came over. Right. And what was, what was that shop like? Who were the people that were there? Well, the older crew was really from Joseph Irvin. They all came over from Austria. And uh, they, w they had a studio in Yonkers, ice skating rink converted into a studio. Right. And they were the main people at Triangle. And I enjoyed working there very much because it was very interesting. I mean, the work was mainly Broadway shows. And did they have, I mean, did they have a view of theater as being, you know, the predominant thing that they wanted to do, or was it just that there wasn't other stuff to paint at the time? Well, that's what they did. They did it well, and uh, that was it. When he died, that shop was formed. Right. And is it mostly drops or three-dimensional scenery? Both. Nolan Both. was on the first three floor. Uh, no. The third, fourth, and fifth floor of the building. And Triangle was the sixth floor. The first two floors were stables for horses. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and what was the size of Triangle? What was the kind of scale of that shop and the pe number of people that worked there? Oh, I'm guessing now. Uh, maybe 45 by 75, 80. And they had an elevator that you went up and down by pulling a rope. You didn't pull the elevator, but it started whatever mechanism it was. Right. That was it. And this was in Lower Manhattan. 
Yeah, 27th Street, 26. And as you mentioned, Willie, Willie Nolan's shop was on the upper level yeah. of the building. So is that how you got to know Willie? Yep. Okay, because he was building scenery and then Triangle, I guess, was, was painted right, for him. Right, Triangle painted. Yes, I used to go down, I mean, uh, I used to go down to the, his shop, talk to Willie, talk to the carpenters, because the conversation of a Triangle was not that interesting. <laughs> Is, is there is there a reason in particular it wasn't that interesting, or is it just? Uh... Well, uh, you know that crew didn't want to leave the shop at all. They were sort of ingrown there, and uh, right. it was much more interesting downstairs with the carpenters. And I like to go down and see what was happening. Right. So you know. what was what was Willie Nolan like? Willie was a rough and tough Irishman who was, I think, brilliant. Uh, I don't know, he was a, a good man. He, he came across to a lot of people as gruff sometimes, but he really wasn't, he was a sweetheart. But, and, and at that time, his shop was relatively established, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he'd been around for a bit. He'd been around for quite a while, and uh, uh, Triangle had a very good reputation. Right. They were very good. Now, after a while, uh, late 50s, early 60s, Willie decides that he doesn't want to be in Manhattan anymore and decides that he's going to move to Brooklyn. I, think I heard a rumor that he was going to move. And I knew him quite well by that time because I used to go down and watch him draft. I mean, that was an education in itself. Right. Because there were no computers then. Everything was drawn and went through a machine called Ozolib, which printed from the tracing paper. And Willie did all the drafting himself, right? At that time, he did. Right. So I heard he was moving, you know, moving someplace in Brooklyn. Right. Uh, and the owner of Triangle lived in Elmsford, which is up here someplace. Yeah, I have an idea of where it is. <laughs> and um. and I, I said to Willie, I hear you moving. And he said, yes. And I said, well, what is Mr. Wilmotsall? Gus gonna do. Right, and that was the person who was painting he, for Willie? He was the own triangle. Right. And he said, I don't care, he's not going. Mm. So I said, you know, I said, who's running your shop? He said, you are. I said, oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that was actually, that's the way it happened. That was the first thing I, you know. And this is just a casual conversation that happens during the day? At yeah, the, lunchtime. <laughs> okay. H how old were you at this point? What, what? Do you remember how old you were at that time? No. Okay. So now, so this is in six. I think guess in sixty one the shop moves into Brooklyn. You know better than me. Yes. So, <laughs> um, and also I believe at that time Charlie Bender and you joined Willie at the shop in Brooklyn. Yes. Well, I won't go into the exact figures, but uh, uh, I was very. Uh, I don't know why I asked him this. I said, Willie, I don't want to be just working for you as a charge man. I want to be part of this business. Right. And he said, yes, I'm going to give you and Charlie both, you know, stock or whatever you wanted to call it. Right. So that's how it was. And did you ever ask him why he chose you? Well, because none of these gentlemen who worked there would ever go out of the shop on touch-ups or on any out-of-the-shop job. Now, we did two shows or three shows at Jones Beach when they were having big productions. I would go as charge because nobody would leave. Mm. Same thing happened at, <coughs> at the World's Fair. Oh, you know, well, the amphitheater they had. Right. So I would be in charge there. And yeah. then we were, we were doing television, a show of shows, the Freddie Fox design. And... Freddie and I became friendly, and uh, I would work on the show from priming the scenery the night before it was painted right. to seeing it all the way through. And um, when that show went to color, when Sid Caesar and Emma Jean Coker were over with the show of shows, right. uh, Freddie was afraid any of his scenery that came on the floor upstairs would not be paid attention to because his television wasn't legit. Right. He said, I want you to be in charge in the shop of the television and watch it. 
And, uh, you know, I, it was a funny position for me to be in with Wimitzel, who owned the shop. And part of the urban bit was everybody was Mr. So-and-so. Mm. Every, even as old people who had worked for him for years, Mr. And we talked, he said, I know what Freddie wants, so you'll be in charge, but only on the television. I said, fine. And he said, Arnold? No, not Arnold yet. He said, oh, can I call you Arnold? Not, and he never called me Mr. again. Right. He called me Arnold. And uh, that went on for a few years. And so Willie knew me, knew what I had done. So when he moved to Brooklyn, that's what he said. And what was the size of the shop in Brooklyn? Hmm. I got to say almost 180 feet by 90 some odd feet. But it was cut in half, part for building, right. part for painting. And how many people worked there? You, was it like a fairly large n crew or what was the size you of mean the- scenic artists? Yeah, scenic artists. No, uh, th at the busiest I'd say 10, 15. I can't remember. And the carpentry, the size of the carpentry was? Maybe more. more. And what, was, what were the types of shows in terms of uh, construction style? Was it mostly two-dimensional style scenery or was there a lot of three-dimensional scenery as well? Everything. There was no one thing. And, and the materials that you were using at the time, mostly wood? Yeah, everything was wood. And, and I believe there's a story about how Willie would put flats together in terms of what materials he would and wouldn't use, and I guess he didn't feel very strongly about glue. That's, yes, I heard that. So. <laughs> no, he was, uh, Willie was quite inventive and very interesting. I mean, and he, he worked very hard. He would, he would come in, he lived in Sparta, New Jersey. Right. He would come in midday, but stay until 11, 12 at night drafting. What was it like for you to go from being a scenic artist to now being a shop owner? What was that transition like? Were you? No different. No different? No different. I, I mean, I, I painted. I loved painting. Right. And uh, the trouble with owning a shop, it's, it's distracting. And you can't just stay on the floor and paint. You right. got to bid on shows. You got to go to the designers to see the presentation. And really, in retrospect, I missed that. I mean, being an owner means you can lose more money. You know, <laughs> not necessarily going to make money. Now, um, now, when you started out, it was uh, Willie, Charlie, and you. Yeah. I, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were in charge of paint, so yeah. the scenic art side. Willie probably was in charge of the construction side. Yeah. What was Charlie was? Charlie was Willie's second hand. I second mean, second. He, he was in charge of construction. And then a few years go by, and I believe Willie passes away? What's that? Did, did Willie retire, or did Willie uh, pass away? He passed away. So he passed away. So that then left you and Charlie yeah. in order to, to run the shop. Let me interject one thing. Going back to when I started in the union, mm. the scale was four and a quarter an hour, which, you know, by today's standards is a joke. And was it, and was it an hourly rate, or did you have a – did you – did you have like for X number in of the, hours? Those shops, if you came in in the morning, there was a day. Right. If you showed up in the morning. And uh, it was, what, like I said, four and a quarter, and uh, overtime per hour was double time. Right. And that was it. Of course, now I don't know what it is an hour, but it's. Right, yeah, it's a little more than four and more. a quarter, I think. Um, so what was so when Willie passes away, I guess you and Charlie now are the owners of the shop. Right. What was Charlie like? What was he like? Yeah, what was what was Charlie like to work with? What was he as Oh, great. Very also very very competent. Very easygoing, very quiet. Right. He was a wonderful wonderful partner. And at that point, I guess the division is still he's dealing with the scenery construction, yeah, you're doing exactly the painting. Exactly the same. Okay. Then a, a, a little bit more time passes, and Charlie passes away. Right. And now you, the studio fine artist, who's found their way into scenery, or into Broadway painting, is now the owner of both a scene shop. Yeah, both. Uh, 
and I put on, it was a, a Charlie second hand, a fellow named Joe Ruggiero. Mm. So he inherited Charlie's thing. Not anything to do, he was just in charge, but he had nothing to do with being on the corporation books. So you, did you? I was the sole owner. You were, so you were the sole owner, but you were able to delegate the scenery construction side to him. Yeah. And he took over that. So you were primarily, I guess at that point, taking on more and more ownership and and bidding and going to meetings and that 100%. sort of thing. 100%. So how much painting were you doing at that point? Myself personally? Yeah. <sighs> Not much. Right. Not and as much as I would have liked to. Right. But I had some wonderful painters working for me. What was an average week like for you at that time? In what way? In terms of hours, what were what was your what was your? I don't know. Was in it at like nine, leave at five. Yeah, I, uh, it was you know eight to whatever seven hours was plus a half hour lunch. Right. And overtime, of course, if there was, which there was. Right. And what types of shows were you painting at that time, or building and painting at that time? Was it just theater, or were you doing a mix of things? A mix of things. We were doing murals, uh, doing decorating in theaters. Freddie Fox did a few theaters. Uh, did some homework jobs for Peter Larkin, which, I mean, he designed, and I ended up painting them. And uh, that was it. I, I didn't paint as much as I would have liked to. Right. But that's it. So now you, you run the shop for a while. Um, you've been in business for a good bit. I would say probably your main competition at the time was Pete Feller Sr. Pete Feller, yes. At, and he owned Scenic Techniques. Yeah. Uh, you obviously knew each other. Yeah. At a certain point, I believe the two of you go to have a meeting or have a meeting. Well. And get to, it, I don't know if it's a meeting or if it's a dinner or if it's. No, what happened with Pete and myself, he, uh, one day uh, uh, we were doing two shows without bids. I think it was for Alexander Cohn. And I told my bookkeeper, look, check on what, we, did we make money at all? Because times were very hard then for everybody. Right. And at the end of the two shows, he said, well, you made money painting but not building. And a coincidence, uh, really, Pete called me up. I don't think anybody told him this. And he said, how are you doing? I told him, I said, well, I'm, uh, painting, we're making money, building, not. And he said, I'm just the opposite. Mm. And this is after many times Pete made entries to try and get together. Right. And I turned, uh, even when Willie was alive, but I turned, you know, no way. Right, he tried to recruit you to his shop. Yeah, right. no way. But this time he, he said, well, I'm just the opposite. I'm losing money painting, mm. and I'm making it building. So I said, all right, Pete, let's have dinner tonight. So we had dinner, and the result was that he decided the next day to go back to his painters and tell them what we're doing, we're done with. And I did the same with the carpenters. I said, after the show's done, we, I'm closing up the carpenter shop. And w and what happened uh, to those carpenters? Did they go off and do something else, or did they? No, they had other shops, whatever. Right. And uh, period in time, and you can look this up on your computer, the first show we did was Sweeney Todd. Right. That started it. And what was it like when you when you joined forces with Pete? What was it like to work with him? What was he like as a person to, to do business with? Oh, Pete was very easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe uh, he found having somebody else paint his scenery was easier than having his own paint shop. Right. He was very relaxed. And you guys were, I, I think, a team for a number of years. I think it was somewhere in the area of 11 or 12, yeah? Whatever you say. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, it's 12 years, so. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, 12 years. Uh, so, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was roughly 79, because in 91, you, show, you decided to close Nolan's down. Well, we had a recession in this country. Right. And uh, uh, I'm 
thinking the last show of something that Robert Wagner did. I was actually about to ask you, do you remember the last show that was in your shop? Yeah. And uh, there was no sense keeping it. Mm. I had a house in Florida. I didn't know what I was going to do in Florida. Right. But uh, I said, all right, I'm moving to Florida. Pete, who politically was very involved with number one and the international. Right. I said, Pete, I got to do something in Florida. Get me a stagehand's card, which he did. So I worked as a stagehand a few times down in Florida at the Kravitz Theater. And um, then one day I got a call from Perry Sylvie from New York City Ballet. Right. And he said, can you paint us two drops? So without having any shop, anything, scenic artists, I said, sure. What do you need, you know? And I went out and uh, a friend of mine, neighbor, who knew real estate around the, the area, uh, I went to see him at his store. He had a carpentry, uh, carpeting store. Right. And I said, Louis, I need space. And he said, well, my landlord has space. And at that moment, landlord pulls up visiting all his tenants. He came in and I told him what I needed. And he said, get in the car and drove over and there's a big warehouse. And that was, I don't know, 120 by 80, let's say. 65 and uh, I rented it because I told Perry I could do it you know? right. <laughs> so I rented it and um, Joe Ruggiero who had been up in uh, New York also lived in Florida and I bought plywood and Joe put the floor down he had some buddies there and um, we were in business and where did you find painters there was one painter, Tom Smith, I think his name was, who had w come to New York looking for work. He was from Florida. Right. And uh, I called him up and he came in and he brought some other people from, or well, one girl really from Florida down in Miami. They came up from Miami, mm. which was an hour's ride at least. And that's the first stuff we did was with them. And is that is that shop Studio South? Studio South. Okay. Then we're there. We're right. in business. And um, I don't know which came first, but uh, there was a gentleman who does big, big parties, uh, and he liked to use backdrops. Right. So he became a, cl a client. We did a lot of work with him. That right. sort of kept us going. And then somebody from Miami City Ballet. His name was Dick Carter. Brought the ballet and me together. And we, that was the two main people. And we still did some work for Broadway. Again for Robin, Kiss Me Kate, mm. which was revived a few years ago. Right. How many years ago? I don't know. And did you do anything studio-wise back in New York after that time? Or was it just the you went when you closed up Nolan's and went south to Florida? You just started Studio South, and that was it. Yeah. Okay. And we uh, then it became too expensive for New York to m send designers down to Florida to check on stuff, whatever, and that died out. So basically, we were down to two good-sized customers. Right. The 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 parties and the Miami City Ballet. And or ask me something else and we'll go on from there. I mean, I don't was, it, was it a union shop? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Always a union shop. Always a union shop. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened with Miami City Ballet, I ended up, they needed a poster for this thing, and a poster, I never knew what it was for, but I painted them. Right. And what it was was the Valella was start, you know, choreographing a new ballet, four acts, and these posters were for each separate act. Mm. And uh, so I was designing in a sense that way. And all of a sudden he, and we were doing backdrops, which at that time he had another choreographer with him from not Cuba, but someplace in South America. So we were doing a lot of drops with palm trees and 
And anyway, he came to me and he said, uh, uh, would you want to design Coppelia? Mm. Sure, why not? I knew Coppelia because we painted it for New York City Ballet that Rubin designed. Right. So I knew what Coppelia was about, you know, physically. So I designed and we painted Coppelia. And then Studio mm -hmm. South lasted for a while, but then I believe you closed it down, yeah? And then you started painting for someone else? Or what's the, the next shop? Is Coconut? So did, well, we, this one girl who became my main scenic artist, had, had two women working there, she was the main one. She loved painting on backdrops, which she hadn't done before. Mm. She was a union member. And uh, she wanted to continue that, so her boyfriend put up the money and they formed uh, Coconut Studios. Right. And I didn't want to be in business anymore, but they needed me. So she owned it or ran it with her boyfriend and uh, I painted. And what she did, she back off completely. She do all the grunt work, she'd prime mm. the drops, she would lay them out, she would do everything but paint. Right. Or lay in stuff, uh, simple stuff, mm. or did some lettering. But she left everything else to me. And you did that and, and worked up until about a year ago, yeah? Yeah. Then, uh, then uh, a party guy really cut down the Madoff thing Right, wiped out a big amount of his clients. Wiped out a lot of his customers. Right. Uh, and then the ballet, they were always short of money. Uh, it was doing less and less and less. Right. So there was, it was untenable for her to stay in business. So we closed. So now let's talk about what you've done in the time as, as a painter over your career. In the process of putting together you know, kind of a complete, as complete a list as I could of what you did. Um, I pulled together a bunch of information from you and we, we worked it together. I did some pullouts of information. So far as I can tell, you painted over 600 Broadway productions in your career, which is. I don't know. And then, and then add to that another 600 easy projects that include dance, opera, radio city, music hall, uh, industrials, mm -hmm. TV. Right. So you've got over 1,200 productions, and that's not counting the industrials, the parties, the other. Right. Things. I'm not. Uh, I don't know, really. It's it's I a pretty long list. Uh, productions are, are, are just. I mean, who's who of productions? So it's you includes things like Sunset Boulevard, Ragtime, 42nd Street, A Streetcar Named Desire, uh, Annie, Barefoot in the Park, Broadway Bound, Camelot, Cats, Chorus Line, Evita, Hello Dolly. La Miz, uh, My Fair Lady, Phantom of the Opera, Showboat, Ziegfeld Follies, on and on and on. So I, I pulled a little bit of information together about this. It turns out you did, as far as I can tell, 15 shows that start with the letter A. <laughs> and by that I mean it's a uh, something, not, you know, like Annie doesn't count. Uh, so 48 that started with the word the. So for, you know, writers out there, apparently the is more successful than A. Um, and, and interestingly enough, uh, only four or five shows that started with E, Q, U, V, Y, or Z. Those apparently are not very popular. Never a show with X as the first letter. So you should have done Xanadu. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I want to I talk about a couple of shows in particular. And I just, I pulled out a random collection of okay. shows just to see. And, and I'd like to get a sense from you in terms of if you remember the experience, if you, if you remember what it was like to work on the show, and maybe talk about some of the people that were involved. Um, sophisticated Ladies in 1981 with Tony Walton. Do you remember, do you remember that show? Was that Tony Walton? Tony Walton, yeah. No, I don't remember it. Okay. <laughs> what was it like to work with Tony? Fine. No, there were... One time we did a show, it's called Hotel Something or about a hotel, the hotel lobby. Right. I mean, Tony was very nice in a way when he liked what you did. 
he would send you a letter, a very nice letter. Right. You know, this was this, this was that. This particular show was unhappy with the, the, the way the floor was painted. It was masonite, and it was scored, and it was to look like a, a floor in a hotel lobby. And I got the nastiest letter in the world <laughs> from him afterwards. He, he said, I've painted scenery, and this is not what I like, and blah, blah, blah. But then afterwards, I've done more work with Tony, and uh, you get the wonderful letters again. So, yeah. In 1983, you did a little show called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Carl Eichstee. Yeah. What was that like? Don't remember. I mean, I just remember working with Carl. Right. It was fine. No. <laughs> Moose Murders. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> well, this is a, a, quite the legendary show, apparently. It, it was one of the Moose Murders in 1983. Chuck London Media is apparently the designer of, of record for that. Don't remember. Okay. How about Ain't Misbehaving, Ain't Misbehaving with John Lee Beatty? A lot of these, I don't remember anything particular about it, but John was... You only did 1,200 productions. I don't understand how you can't remember all of them. John was always a pleasure to work with. How about Jerome Robbins, uh, Broadway with Boris Aronson? He didn't do that. No? That's what I have. That's what I know. So. All right. No, no, Robin did it. Do I have that completely wrong? Yes. Quite possible. Oliver... Oliver did some of that. Robin. There. You're wrong. How about Grant? <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time, as I'm sure my daughter would be happy to tell you. Okay. Grand Hotel. Who did that? I. Who do you think did it? Tony Walton. I have Santa Loquasto. What's that? Santa, but I'm guessing this is wrong. That's Audience? wrong. Audience. Because Grant. Tony Walton, right. I don't and that's the, that's who wrote the, these cards? That's the infamous, that's the infamous hotel floor, Grand Hotel. Right. <laughs> All right, moving on. Good. <laughs> Volkswagen A and its sequel, Volkswagen B. It's an industrial. It was like very early in your career. Who did that? You know. Your shop. No, you don't I don't know who designed, who designed it. it, no. Because we did industrial shows for Ben Edwards. Oh, okay. I think Buick and a few others. Okay. Is there a show in particular that stands out that you'll never forget? One that, like, rises to the top that is, like, this is... Yeah, there's one show, ballet for New York City Ballet, that Ruben designed. And I called... Perry Sovey to find out what was the name of his damn thing. And I say damn because that's the way I felt. Right. And it was um, a ramp with two, I'd say 15 foot tall wings on either side. And those wings, we worked, we worked all, whatever time, plus the day before it loaded out until about midnight. Mm. It petered out, people kept leaving and getting out of there. But I was there till about midnight, and I finally, Perry's away now, he's in Europe. I, I remember the name of the show now, I think it's called Sphinx. Mm. I've got to check on it, you know, when he gets back. Right. Because he didn't remember it at all. <laughs> but, uh, but that drove me nuts. Ruben could be, he was a wonderful designer, but he could be very difficult, mm. and he was. And, uh, that's the one I remember as being, I want to pull my hair out, okay. Is, is there a show artistically that you painted that as a painter you were able to take a step back from and look at and go, that's it, I really... No. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, uh, I worked with Oliver Smith a lot. Right. And there were some beautiful things. And with all these designers, they... But from your from your hand, in terms of the painting, in terms of the quality of the painting, is there? Oh, I don't remember. Oh. Uh, is there is there a production you ever worked on that frightened you as an artist? 
frightens me. Yeah, that was the presented challenges that were, you know, something, you know, significant that you had to figure out how to do. No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, uh, uh, there's really nothing new in what you do. Right. I mean, there's different approaches and this and that, but no, I never had that feeling that it's something that was that hard. So in, <laughs> in terms of the designers you've worked with, you've worked with a lot of designers over the years. Yes. Who, who are the ones that really stand out in your memory of, of, as being people that you really enjoyed working with as colleagues? <laughs> They're out there. I can't see them. <laughs> 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 well, uh, Oliver, uh, Robin, Ben Edwards, uh, David Hayes was very interesting in so many ways. Uh, God. Most of them. They're, they're, as I said with Ruben, I remember the hard, hard things, you know. Right. Uh, Boris Aronson was a lot of fun. He was a character. Mm. Um, uh, well, the story with Boris, and I hope this never gets back to his wife. Uh, and I told you this story. Well, nobody's watching, so it's, uh, it's just you and me. Uh, we had this show with two drops. Uh, the first drop was a whole side view of a, a clobbered house. And the sketch was in ra really raw, but it was all gray and tan. The second drop was the same house, but one side red, one side green. Two owners bought the house, split it in half, and there were, the personalities were on each side. And Johnny Keck, who was a wonderful painter and who uh, Boris had so much faith in, and I painted the colorful side. Mm. Almost done. And Rudy Lusek always liked to work in grays and umbers. They gave him the other side. So we're there and Boris comes in and he looks at the umbery side, which Rudy did, and he said, that's wonderful. But I don't like the other house with the colors that Johnny and I painted. And as I say, he would lie down dead for Johnny. Mm. And then I told him, I said, okay. And he said, could you switch now? So we went over to you know, whatever it was, it was a dirty trick I pulled on Boris, but uh, that was it. Now, now, when you were working, did you have any pet peeves? Were there things that, you know, would drive you crazy that if somebody in the shop did? Or were you pretty laid back and easygoing? No, sometimes there were things. I mean, I can't... I, uh, Oh, you, you mentioned uh, Joe Marvin's Broadway. Mm. And I'll mention no names. Uh, I forget the name, name of the show where, uh, who flew over London? Peter Pan. <laughs> well, whatever the show was, and it was uh, just like a pen and ink drawing. Right. On a bluish background. And the artist, I gave it to him and I said, look, the, the, here's a sketch. The, there's a variety of weight and lines. And this artist, just everything was just a thick line. Mm. And I hated it, hated it. And the designer came in and same thing. So I had to take this person off. Notice I didn't say man or woman. I had to take, I had to take her off it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's things like that. You know, you have, you have wonderful artists working for you, and sometimes they just miss the boat, and this mm -hmm. was the case of it. And when an artist first started working for you, what was the process? Did you have a test? Did you anything in particular to see what their skills were? Or how did you evaluate whether or not they were ready to take something on? I don't know. You like 
the way they approach things. If you if you give them a chance, mm -hmm. very funny. I was uh, there was a show down in the Boca Museum recently, and this uh, scenic artist had this show, and the paintings were very very competent. And I went over and started talking to him, and I, I realized he had worked for me. I said, you've worked at Nolan's, didn't you, many years ago? And he said, yeah. I said, did I ever give you anything to do? And he said, props. I said, well, wait. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how you get to know people, right. by helping others see how much they progress by watching. Now, you've had a lot of people over the years, you've had a lot of people come through your shop and, and work for you or with you. And I mean, it's a list of names that I'm going to miss a whole bunch of them, but it includes people like Herb Steinberg, John Pitts, Bob Motley, Lynn Pechtel, uh, Joe Forbes, John Lee Beatty, Claire Hine, uh, Harry Garrow, Kenny Callender, Eleanor Shanbaum, uh, Janet Stapleman, Lawrence Casey, just to name a few. All yeah. amazing, legendary people. There's two, in peop there's two people in particular I'd like to ask you about uh, and get a bit more information about uh, because of the role they played and who they were. The first is Johnny Keck. Can you, what can you tell us about Johnny and, and your relationship with him? And well, uh, Johnny worked at McDonald Stevens with Fred Jacoby. Mm -hmm. And I had heard rumors that they were closing up. And Johnny came over came for a job, and he came and he worked. And he, of course, he was wonderful. He painted wonderfully. He was a wonderful sculptor. And uh, he was at the shop maybe two, three weeks. And then he said, you know, Fred Jacoby would like to come over and work. I said, sure, fine. I was always curious about who was, who would charge, another, who would charge people in other shops. I wanted to know what they did. Right. And Freddie came over, and he never really was a, a scenic artist you could give a drop to, but Freddie knew how to starch drops. He knew how to paint all the little things. And really, if you look at Lynn Pechtel's book, most of it's in there because Lynn attached himself to Freddie right. and got all the information. And I think Johnny came over to check the place out before Freddie came. That's what. And, and Freddie was the other person I wanted to ask you about. So, it, what were they like as you know artists and as people? And I mean, what was it like to work with them over the years? Oh well, J Johnny was wonderful. I mean, he was very, very talented, mm -hmm. both as a as a painter and a sculptor. And Freddie knew everything. Right. You know, I learned a lot from Freddie. Sure. I learned a lot from everybody who worked in the shop. You know? and, and what were the materials that you were working with in your shop at that time? What was what was scenic art like in terms of type of paint? Media and yeah, what were you what were you using? I guess it was uh, towards the end it was Roscoe and before that it had been uh, When you first started what was what was the, oh, the state uh, of the art? I, going back to triangle it was uh, glue that you'd cook up, and all, there was the regular glue, granular glue, and then there were cakes of rubber glue. Right. Which, for flexible, you know, back wraps. And that was it. And then it became casein, or Idding's casein. And so you would, now let me just go back for a second. So you would take the glue, you'd heat it, you melt it down, and then tint it with aniline dyes at that time, or? No, a pigment. 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 You could add aniline dyes to jazz right. the color up, you right. know, and do it. And one thing I love to work with, and I still do, is starch. Mm -hmm. It's transparent, flows easily. It's a, a wonderful medium to work with, a lot of starch and color. Right. Uh, and then towards the end, you're... Towards the end, when I moved to Florida and this girl who came to work for me, she, she said, you know, wh why are you importing, you know, paint from New York? It was expensive. Right. Because you, didn't you couldn't get it in Florida. Right. So I said, why? What else can I use? And she had worked with Benjamin Moore house paint. And if you go to Benjamin Moore, 
and they, they have different bases, a deep base, a medium base. In the deep base, you add, let's say, 12 ounces of their color, the, the right. concentrated stuff. That made up of wonderful paint. And the whole time in Florida, w I used that. So you were using and just as I enjoyed it just as much as any paint I'd ever used mm. before. It was a gr it's a great paint. If somebody came to you and said, you know, there's been this strange anomaly in the world, and going forward you're only ever going to be able to use one brush to paint. What? Say that again? You're only ever going to be able to use one brush. You can't, you don't get to have a whole collection of them. You don't have, what brush are you going to use to paint with? One brush I enjoyed was maybe a two or three inch Fitch. I found I'd pick that out and paint. Right. I mean, there were other brushes naturally, but I found those the easiest. I don't know if you can get good brushes like the ones I had. You right. know, I don't know what they're making today, but those were good. And did you have prized brushes? I know a lot of artists have like a, a brush or two in particular that they cherish among the collection. No. It's all, it's all in the hand. I mean, you know, it can be a sponge. Right. It can be a rag. Right. It can be a brush sometimes. Did you have a particular uh, type of painting? Like, did you, were you, you know, particularly drawn to theater, to ballet, opera? Did it matter to you what the, what the, out, what the last product was going to be going towards? Or just the art of painting was the enjoyable thing? What was the first part of what you question? What, what field, you know, did it matter to you what field the, the project came from, whether it was TV or theater or opera or dance? Did you have a particular area that you liked to paint? No, uh, no area. I mean, uh, the, the types of things that you get, I didn't enjoy for myself very detailed or tight painting. I right. like to paint loosely. A lot of times transparently. And did you have a preference towards drops or three-dimensional objects? Drops. And, and drops. Right. So largely. So once you were in a position where you could assign props to other people. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, in Florida, we didn't. We ended up not painting much built scenery. It, right. It was the one shop that I did work with closed up. They weren't that great to build in the first place, but that's they were there. Right. But after they closed up, there was nobody to build. So it was just we were doing just drops. So now you're officially retired at this point. Yes. Are you still painting? Have you now gone full circle back to studio art? It's hard to motivate yourself, but yes. I mean, it, it's difficult. I got to get used to not having the pressure. Right. That deadline really focuses you. Oh, sure. <laughs> if you were giving advice to somebody who is just now starting out as a scenic artist, what would you tell them? What, what advice would you give them in terms of what should they do to become a scenic artist? Draw, draw, draw. I mean, uh, I hate to use the word academically, but you know, basically perfect your technique of drawing because I think after that you can paint anything. I mean, that's mm. Looking back over the years, the many people that you've known and worked with and the things that you've done, is there anything that you would, if you could, go back and change, do maybe a little differently, or has everything pretty much worked out the way it should? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, no, I, I, I did what I enjoyed. I enjoy, I, I love doing it. So there's no place I can go back and say one thing more than the other. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's very funny. This has to do with being a painter, uh, driving from the airport 
up here. Right. Going through Queens and Brooklyn. And the things I saw in the, even the ugliest houses or streets, maybe they reminded me of, I would think, what would Hedward, Edward Hopper do with this mm. particular thing? And then I kept thinking about it, and uh, I thought to myself, you know, if I hadn't moved to Florida, I might still be painting like crazy. Mm. But it's a different landscape, it's a different feeling. Right. And even though the, the streets are, you know, not very pretty, but that's what I would have enjoyed painting. Right. But I'm in Florida. Right. Looking back over, you know, the many productions and the shows that you probably uh, didn't get because there were other shops at the time, is there a show that you wish you had gotten? No, well, I don't know of any. I mean, I never, if you didn't get the show, I mean, you can't tell enough just by going to see it right. on stage. You're talking about working with a designer and the time you got to do it and everything attached to it, so no. Looking back, knowing what you know now, thinking back to when you were in college and you were a studio artist and you were painting, it, obviously there was a point after you graduated from college that your life took a different direction and you headed down the path of being a scenic artist and being in the world of theater and, mm -hmm. and the arts and performing arts. Looking back now, are you happy that you did it or would you have rather just stayed a studio artist? I'm happy I did it. You know. The for me, the transition from just painting into painting scenery in that scale was very easy. Mm. I never found it difficult. And I think it was because of the background I had in painting and drawing that I was able to do that. Right. I don't know. You know, you step in another direction, your life can be completely different. Right. But uh, I've always enjoyed it. Do you ever think that, you know, there but by the grace of God? I mean, it, it, it is pretty fascinating. I mean, you came back to New York, started painting, and it just took off. Did, you, did it ever occur to you that you were going to spend such a long time in this field? No, I never thought about it that way. It just happened. Just do it. Well, it's a, it, it's a very, very impressive and lengthy body of work. So it's, it's pretty amazing. I have one last thing I need to do. Ryan? <laughs> and that's to present you with this. Oh. Which reads. <laughs> Aha! The Broadway Technical Theater History Project recognizes Arnold Abramson, backstage legend and master, for his distinguished career and role in bringing so many Broadway productions to the stage. April 22, 2013. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Oh. Arnold Abramson, everybody. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody here, and I'd like to thank Arnold, and invite everybody that's here to a reception we're going to have in the upper lobby, and I'll be bringing Arnold out in a couple of minutes and hope to see all of you there. So thank you and good evening. Oh. <laughs>